Father, we see that we are so grateful to you. We give you the praise. We give you the glory. We thank you that you are the Lord that does not change. And you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. We can count on your faithfulness. Our faith is in the faithfulness of Christ, who gave a promise and stuck by the promise that while we were yet sinners, oh, you died for us because you made an oath and a promise. You swore that oath in Jesus and Jesus executed it. And that is why we are gathered here, Lord, to be able to take advantage of what you have made available to us and live it maximally to the fullness, to the fullness to overflowing. And not only that, but also to raise other disciples, students, learners of the same material so that according to the word of God, the knowledge of the Lord, the knowledge of God will cover the entire earth as the waters cover the land. If there is anything that stands in the way of our understanding, I remove it and I allow only the revelation, the light of Christ to shine and swallow up everything that is not of God. I thank you for utterance. I thank you for insight. I thank you for clarity. And I thank you for the unction of the Holy Spirit. I thank you for these ones that are here. For with humble hearts and dedicated hearts and listening here and hearts, Lord, they are here. They are here to listen, to learn, to unlearn, to relearn to the praise of your name. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, 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 good afternoon again. Well, in this part of my world, here all the way from the east of London, Full Gospel Church International, the London branch, um, a, which is called the Christ Revealed Center, which speaks about the vision of this ministry. Our vision is to reveal Christ and Christ only, to reveal all that Jesus has done in the believer, to reveal all that the believer has in Christ and to reveal what the believer can do through Christ and what Christ can do to the believer. So we are, we are justified in Christ and he is glorified in us. And that is it. And we, so we continue with our teaching devotional epignosis online or epignosis daily. The word epignosis in red, as I always explain, is not some new fangled notion. It just simply means accurate understanding, precise understanding, clear understanding, comprehensive understanding that is found in the writings of the foundational apostles, Paul, Peter, James, the writer of Hebrews, and the letters of Paul to Timothy, to Titus, and to Jude. Collectively, all those books are called the accurate knowledge of God. So they come under the title epignosis. Hence, the reason why I've chosen that. Why? Because this body of books, from the writings of Romans to the writings of Jude, they form the basis or the framework taken out of the Old Testament of our doctrinal persuasion. They inform us what we should teach consistently and what we should not teach. So anything outside this framework is not the gospel. So we have the gospel has a specific framework and a specific syllabus. That is why we chose epignosis. This is what the church should teach. So welcome to this Believer's Bible Study Fellowship with myself, Reverend Fred Abeka, Lady Patience Abeka, the leaders of the church, and you, all you amazing saints. Well, get your pens and notebooks ready, and let us get ready for an adventure into the revelation of the word of God in Christ. And so we continue with our theme for this year, spiritual growth, spiritual growth. And as usual, because we, we, we broke off on Thursday to do the online Bible uh, uh, Ministry Academy on Friday, I just want us to refresh our minds and then we'll go into today. So we said spiritual growth, what it is and what it is not. Lesson 133. Season number one, 133 hours in expanding and getting to grips with this. We said spiritual growth is not your spirit inside you growing in size or stature over time. Spiritual growth 
It's not how many years a person has been in Christ. Spiritual growth is not a position or a title that one occupies. In terms of the apostolic foundation, spiritual growth refers to having a clear understanding of the writings of the apostles and how they all fit together in one singular message, salvation by faith in Christ Jesus. So that when I see a Bible verse here, and I see another Bible verse here, which seem to contradict, if I have read it enough to grow in that understanding, I will know that it's not a contradiction, but probably it is either an emphasis or a de-emphasis, or it depends on the audience of the people that the person was writing to. So what we look out for in spiritual growth is what is consistent in the writings of the apostles. So if nothing is consistent, then it's not a doctrinal basis. So we focus on what is consistent. We do not throw away what is not consistent, but what we know is that there is a reason why that is not consistent. So this is what spiritual growth talks about. So putting that into perspective, then that means there are concepts in our work in God that need, requires clear understanding. And one area that we have just started dealing with is the believer's spiritual authority. So we said that because of the word war, warfare, in the Bible, especially in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, it creates the impression that we are fighting an unfinished battle. Then when we come to Ephesians chapter 6, from verse 12 downwards, we talk about, for we wrestle not. So the moment we see the word wrestle not, it creates the impression that we are engaged in a kind of a combat where it is almost impossible to finish it. But that is not what Paul said. So we explain that the believer is superior to Satan. And we said that in our authority, it is given to us from the day you were born again. The problem with many believers is that they do not know their authority. And even if they know, they don't apply it or use it often, once in a while. So it creates the impression that God is not answering. It creates the impression that God is prolonging stuff. It creates the impression that God is allowing because he wants to teach you a lesson. But the root of that problem is that the person has not read the epistles well to see the emphasis on the apostles. Whether they were saying that we are fighting an unfinished battle, we don't know, or that God is the one causing it, but we have debunked all that in what we've been studying so far. So now we are dealing with another, another mindset in the area of authority. And this is the question that we, we started with last week, still on the believer's authority. The question is that, does the presence of prolonged problems and pressures mean there's something wrong with me or you, or there is a case? That's the question. So we said that the boundary of accurate teaching is found in the emphasis of Jesus Christ before and after the cross. So did Jesus Christ ever, even by the slightest chance, teach in all the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, consistently that if there is a prolonged issue, it means that there's something wrong with you. Did Paul, Peter, James, John, the writer of Hebrews, ever also insinuate anything like that? So far, what we studied is not so. What we came to the conclusion was that because of the fault, because of the fault of the sin nature, DNA of Adam, it brought the entire planet and its systems into a place of a flaw. So that's why we say Job chapter 5, verse 6 to 7 says, for affliction comes not from the dust, figure of speech, neither does trouble spring forth out of the ground, figure of speech, verse 7. But man is born to trouble as the sparks and the flames fly upward figure of speech. So what is the writer of Job saying? He's saying that when you look at fire, which is burning, once in a while, when the wind blows on the fire, it brings out what we call a spark, S-P-A-R-K. But the spark did not generate on its own. The spark came from the ball or the mass of fire. 
So what the writer of Job is saying is that problems, troubles, affliction, they are an offshoot. They are a re, as a result of something fundamental. And we examine and realize that the fundamental issue that brought problem to this planet, brought pressures to the life of man, is the sin of Adam. That is what brought everything. The moment Adam sinned, the entire constitution of planet Earth and the entire constitution of man was flawed. It had inherent flaws in it. So nothing that man does can be perfect. No matter the best systems that a man puts in place, there will be something that will go wrong. So our system that we live in has got flaws. And it is these flaws that Satan capitalizes on and uses it to put pressure on man so that you would think that God is the one doing it. So that was what we reached. And let us go. So now we are examining if in any of the writings of the apostles, they insinuated anything in that regard that because there's prolonged problem, prolonged problem, then it means that there's something wrong with you. So we saw so far that there is nothing wrong with you because even James made it clear that, you know, that the problem that you and I are going through is, is, is all over with the brethren in the world. Then Paul also in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 also said the same thing, that there is no temptation that has taken you that is not common to man. In other words, no matter the severity of a problem that one faces, somebody's own is of a lesser level, just that you don't know. But whether it is of a higher level, of a lesser level, it is an experience common to man. And so he said also in James chapter one, that let no man say that when he's tempted, He's tempted of God, for God does not tempt anyone with evil, nor he himself is tempted of evil. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 13, Paul reiterates the same thing. For no temptation, no trial, regarding as enticing to sin, S-I-N, regarding that which came out of the sin of Adam, the flaw, no matter how it comes or where it leads, has overtaken you and laid hold on you, that is not common to man. That means the sin of Adam is more serious and weightier and has a more stronger influence than any other problem you are facing in the world. Why? It was only the sin of Adam that brought spiritual death, that brought eternal death, that brought mortality, that brought the curse of the earth, that eventually brought about sinful behavior and it brought about also the curse of the law. No other sin, no other problem has the capacity to be at the same level as Adam's sin. So that's what the Bible says in Romans chapter 5, verse number 14, that, that then sin passed from Adam to Moses, even over to those who did not sin in the likeness or in the example or in the type of Adam's transgression. So Adam's transgression is the granddaddy of all sinful behavior, is the granddaddy of all problems in planet Earth. So the problem that we are facing or the problem that anybody is facing cannot be greater than that. And in that, Jesus dealt with that. Can you see that now? So that is why I said that no temptation or trial has come to you that is beyond human resistance and that is not adjusted and adapted and belong to human experience. That means Adam's own was the highest. All the rest of problems and pressures we face, they are normal in human existence. But none of them brought spiritual death. Okay. So he said, but God is faithful to his word. The word word here is to his promise and his compassionate nature from Genesis. And he can be trusted not to let you be tempted and tried and as said beyond your ability and strength or resistance and power to endure. So what he's saying is that there is no other problem or sin that is higher than Adam's. None. So which means that, which means that whatever we are facing, if Adam's own was the highest, 
then what we are facing is diminutive of Adam's. So it is not, it's not a big deal, and God is not the one. But look at look at God's work in this. Look at God's look at God's work in this. But with the temptation, he will also provide, uh, he will also provide uh, the way out. The way out is his word. The way out are his precepts. The way out is his authority. The way out is the revelation of his word. He provided that in Christ. He said that he and what he said that, that he may provide. Look at it. The did you see that? The way out here. The he didn't say a way. Uh, did you see that? The Bible says in John chapter 14, that Jesus Christ is the the way, the way, the way. So the way out is Christ. The way out is Christ. The means of escape to a landing place. The landing place is Christ that you may be capable and strong and powerful to bear up under it. So what he's saying is that when you are in problem, instead of thinking about why me, you must be conscious to think about, I have somebody in me. Instead of thinking about why me, remember that you have somebody inside you, Christ in you, the hope of glory, Kabadaya. So when you remember the Christ in you, who is the authority, the clothing, the vestiture of your power and authority, then where is the complaint? I dive on him, I rely on him, and I charge his power, and I use his power to deal with that seemingly temptation. Can you see that now? So once again, Paul has made it clear that, he, you did see he did not focus on why of the problem, how of the problem. He said there's a solution, Christ. Right. So with that at the back of our mind, we've done James already. So let's get into a few details. And today I want us to look at some examples of the apostles. Let's look at some apostles. But now I want to answer a part B of this one. One, does prolonged prolong problems mean that there's something wrong with me and also that there's a curse? So far, no, but we'll still, we'll still continue. But there's also a second part of that question. Does that mean that when I have a lot of problems, I am out of the will of God? Because some believers also position themselves like that, that because they are in a place of many problems, it means they are, they are not in God's will. Because they are saying, that, ah, how can I be in God's will and I'm facing problems like this? So let us see if there's any hint of such a position with the apostles. Second Corinthians chapter 1, verse 5 to 10. Follow and listen attentively. Paul is talking, for just as Christ's own sufferings. Now, anytime you see the word sufferings in the Bible, you have to look at the context or why is the writer using it where he's using it. Why? Because in the word of God, one word does not mean the same thing everywhere. You, every word lends its meaning within the book or the chapter. So Paul can use sufferings here to mean something, but he can use sufferings again in another book to mean something else. That is why you got to read carefully and not give a blanket meaning to every word. There is what we call no omnibus application to any word in the Bible. Every word must be explained with each chapter, each verse, each passage to be on the safe side. So when we see the word sufferings here, he's not talking about suffering like sickness, disease, poverty, you know, hardship. That is not what he's talking about. The, the emphasis here was talking about ministry, the preaching of the word, that once you go and start to preach the word, it will bring opposition. If you are preaching the word and you're not facing opposition, you're not preaching the word. You are compromising. Why? Because he said that Jesus is, a, is a, 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 a rock, a stone that causes people to stumble. He said, for the offense of the cross is seized. He said, if I preach the gospel and thereby there is no offense, people are not offended, then the offense of the cross. He said, why am I being, why am I being persecuted, I Paul, when I'm talking about the cross? So the suffering here is persecution pressure because you are a believer and you are preaching the gospel. You are preaching the right thing. Satan does not like that. Why? You are bringing light to people. See that now? So for just as Christ's own what? What? Suffering or pressure or opposition fall to our lot 
as they overflow upon his disciples and we share and, and experience them ab did you see that? abundantly. So did it mean that we're out of the will of God? No. Just the mere fact that you are born again. Satan does not like your head. Not only you. Satan does not like anybody because he was a murderer from the beginning. He hates anybody who is a human being, more so the believer. So he said that because of that, have you noticed that when before you became born again, I've heard Christians say this, that before I became born again, life was cooler, it was cool. But the moment I got born again, it's one problem after the other. Exactly. It is expected. You are light and you expose darkness. You are light in your family. You are light in your workplace. You are light in your business. When you are moving around, it's light moving around. Satan does not like it. That's why Jesus said that men dwell in darkness and they love darkness so they don't want to come to the light lest their deeds be exposed. So the fact that you are light in a world of darkness, darkness cannot comprehend the light. So darkness will do everything to smother the light. That's why I said that we experience this precious abundantly. Why? So through Christ, Christ's comfort, consolation, and encouragement is also shared and experienced abundantly by us. So anytime pressure comes, the Christ in me, the power of Christ in me, the knowledge of Christ in me is so well developed that it comes against. So even though it looks like problem after problem, but the spirit of God in me is far more adopted to handle that. Why? Because the greatest one, which was the sin of Adam, which required death, has been handled. So the capacity of the level of our power is to the level of death handling. It handled death in all its forms. It handled spiritual death. It handled physical death. It has handled eternal death. It has handled the curse of the law, the strongest of the ever that came to planet Earth. So that means that the capacity of your spirit, if it could, it could handle spiritual death, physical death, eternal death, the curse of the law. That is why Paul will say in the book of Romans 8, 11, if the spirit of him, uh, the spirit of Christ that dwells in me, uh, that spirit, uh, that spirit, that, that the same spirit that God raised Christ from the dead, if that spirit dwells in me, it will quicken or revitalize my mortal body. They think certain things is putting pressure on you. Oh, but when you see the pressure, it pushes you to pray in tongues or more. And by pushing you to pray in tongues or more, you have charged the overdrive power and that overdrive power takes away the problem. Then he comes again. He thinks that what you have is something that is once in a while. He doesn't know that it abides with you permanently. So no matter how many times he comes, you have more than enough to deal with him a million times abundantly. So he said that at the same time, we share in that comfort. The word comfort here, here, this word comfort here, is the word paraclesis, comfort, paraclesis, Hebadiah. The word para, like we get parachute, paramedic, para, for medic, towards medic. So when you use the word paraclesis, it means that the power of God that is towards, towards your help, towards your comfort. It act, that power is like a standby generator. Uh, you see you see the generator in your house. Uh, the moment the power goes off, pump, automatically it switches on. See that now, if it's the modern type. So that's why he's talking about that. You have got the paraclesis in you. The moment problem comes, even though on the physical, you might be crying. On the physical, you might not. But inside you, the paraclesis has been engaged. It has been engaged. All of a sudden, you feel something like pray some more in tongues, pray some more in tongues, pray some more in tongues. The paraclesis has been engaged. We are not cheap people. Kabaya. Then he says, but if we are troubled, look at the word trouble, afflicted, distressed, it is for your comfort. So what Paul is saying that don't worry about us apostles. We are frontliners. 
the pressures we are going through to lay down the framework of, of the gospel is okay. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about us. You see that? And for your salvation. It is for your comfort. It is for your consolation. It's for your encouragement for the purpose of the topics of salvation. And if we are comforted, consoled, and encouraged, it is for your comfort, which works in you. Did you see that? Did you see that? Huh? The, the comfort, the paraclesis, that's what works in you. That word works in you is the Greek word energio. Let me write it here for those who are making notes. Energio. It is like, it is like a generator. The Greek word is here. Energio. Energio. That's the word there. Energio. That's the Greek word for which works in you. Energio. It is a living power energy. Like, like electricity that is turned on 24 7. He's talking about the spirit energy, which works. It's an active verb. It's an active verb. You see now. So, what, what does that mean? That when you are in problem, the spirit of God is trying to get your attention inside, but you are you your mind is still outside. So, whilst you're in problem, the spirit of God is tapping your shoulder. I am here. I am here. I am here. I am here. I handled something greater than this problem. I handled something far deadly than this problem. So turn to me because I have the capacity. Then you are reminded and then you turn inward and begin to speak in tongues. You will speak in tongues about 30 minutes, one hour. And then all of a sudden, it's like that burden is lifted. Sometimes you might pray more than one hour. There's something we call pray through. What it means that you pray and then sometimes, not always, but sometimes you sense that within you that the burden is lifted. The energy has dealt with it. That is why he's in you. That is why, whether the thing is prolonged or not, that is why he's there. He said that which works in you, energy, when you patiently endure, watch, 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 patiently endure the same evil. Huh? The same evils. The same, the same. So what is that same evil? Always Satan is coming after the light. The light is the revelation of Christ. Why? He does not want to discover your authority. He does not want to discover that you're superior to him. So his way of making that look nonsense or stupid is to bring pressure so that you get to breaking point. Then you end up and say, it is not working. But I have news for you. A new day has dawned. There are men and women boys and girls who have caught hold of the revelation of Christ, who will not who will not sit down. If he plays for three months, we stand our ground for three months. If he stands for six months, we stand for six months. It's one year we stand for until what already is there that has been delivered, we have the, the energy has cleared it out so that you can see and receive what is yours already made available. That's why I said, when you patiently endure the same evil, that means some will not be patient to endure. Now, the word patient to endure does not mean that fold your arms and do nothing. What it means is that regardless of what is coming from the outside, that makes you think it's long, prolonged. It should not cause you to change your emotional position towards God. What is the emotional position? That after a while you say, it's taking too long. I can't see the answer. You have changed. You have changed. Because he said that when you patiently and you look at the same evil misfortune. Do you know that the word evil means lying, slander, deceptive? See that? So the, the, the misfortune is trying to deceive you. The calamity is trying to deceive you. What is the aim of that deception for you to think that it's God who is involved? For you to think that God does not want you to have it. For you to think that God is against you. For you to think that there's something wrong with you. For you to think that there's some kind of curse. All of this is that evil. The word evil in the original Greek means deception, lies, slander. See that now? That we all suffer, all of the apostles, without reservation. Barnabas, Paul. Andronicus, Sostenes, Apollos, Peter, James, 
Priscilla, Aquila, they all faced the same. And even in their time, it was more dreadful because there was no technology. There was no, there was no health services like we have today. There was, no, there was nothing planned. So even their own is more worse. So what should they say? Verse 7, and our hope for you, our joyful and confident expectation of good for you is ever, you didn't see that, ever unwavering. That should be my attitude. Oh, yes, it's three months I've been praying, but I am unwavering because I know that God has already delivered it to me. It is Satan on my mind that is playing games on me so that I don't remember that I have it. This is the number one act trick of Satan. Satan wants you always to know that you don't have it. Someone will say, okay, so what about if after 10, 10 years I've not received anything? Oh, then, then, then obviously God has something better. <laughs> then obviously God has something better. But you must stand your ground. He said, unwavering. Where is the unwavering? In your mind. In your mind. Concerning what? What the word of God that you have learned about Christ, that it never changes. Unwavering, assured, and unshaken. See that now? Did you see that now? Unwavering. Where? In your mind. In your emotions. Now, this does not mean that, um, you know, there are some days that, you know, you might, you might, you might sort of falter. No, what it means is that this attitude of unwavering and assured should not last for long. Sometimes as human, you hear news and of course as human, you will feel bad or sometimes down. That is fine. But don't let it last uh, for one week, two weeks. That's what he's talking about. That the unwavering attitude should be implemented instantly. When you are not spiritually grown, you might wallow in there for maybe two weeks, three weeks and complaining. The more you mature in the understanding of this, you will last in that area of emotional down maximum, maybe a number of hours. See that? Now, if you get to a time, you will, in minutes, see that? Now? In minutes, you just, you just, you just dispel it. So he said, ever unwavering. So it's not a case of the fact that sometimes you're not be done. Even if you are down momentarily, pick yourself up quickly, knowing whom dwells in you. Assured and unshaken. Look at the next one. Assured and unshaken. For we know that just as you share an apartness huh, in our sufferings and calamities. Once again, it's not about poverty. It's not about sickness. It's not about disease. It's about the satanic pressure because you are a believer and you preach the gospel. That's all. Jesus said in the, in the parable of the sower, he said that affliction or pressure or persecution comes huh, not because of you, because of the word. Because of the word. The word is Christ. It's the most deadliest weapon because Jesus defeated him with the word. For we know that just as you share and are partners in our suffering and calamities, you also share and are partners in our comfort, consolation, encouragement. Watch. This is what I want you to see. Paul was in the will of God. How do I know that? Because on the road to Damascus, when he saw the blinding light, and then before that, God spoke to him. God had also spoken to Ananias in Acts chapter 9 and told him that go to a house on the street straight and inquire of one called Saul. For he seeth a man coming to put his hands on you that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias replied, Kebadiah, for I have heard by many how this one, is wasting the church. Then Jesus replied, he is a chosen vessel of mine, for I must show him how many things he must suffer for the kingdom's sake. And once again, the suffer is not sickness, disease, or calamity. What he meant with that, 
for 6,000 years to 7,000 years, Israel had been used to Judaism, the religion of the Jews, starting from Abraham. And so they only knew of one way to take care of sins, the day of atonement, whereby they bring two goats. All Israel will stand outside. One goat is known as the Pascal lamb. The other goat is known as the scapegoat. The two of them are symbolic of Christ, his work against sin. And they did it year in and year out. So what he meant was that Paul was called to change that mindset that there was no more a requirement for those two goats, no more a requirement for the high priest, no more a requirement for temple worship. And that the only way you are made righteous is no longer by the law, except by faith in Jesus. Do you think you can change the mindset of a nation which had this Judaism enshrined in their cultural makeup? So God needed somebody who would be audacious, who would be strong, who would be daring, willing to put his life on the line for that change to take place. That is what he meant. And Paul gladly accepted it. How do we know? In Acts chapter 26, when Paul stood before Agrippa, Kaduli Brakata Yaba, he said that, oh, when I was traveling one day at noon on the road to Damascus, I saw a blinding light. Then he continued, and I saw him, and he spoke to me that, you know, I'm sending you so that you will bring men from darkness to light from the power of Satan to the power of Christ. Then he continued, he said, oh, King Agrippa, when I heard that, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision or the heavenly assignment. So this is what Paul, so Paul knew already the presence or the opposition that will come. So now he continues to talk, verse eight. For we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about the affliction and oppressing distress which befell us in the province of Asia. So he went into Asia, if you start to read it from Acts chapter 16. Paul had wanted to go into Asia prematurely earlier, but God told him not yet. Then one day, as he was sleeping, he had a vision and he saw a man say, Come to Macedonia and help us. We call that the Macedonian call. Macedonia was a region in the area of the province of Greece. But after that, it was in Macedonia that the church of Philippi was born through a lady. And through that, that same place was where he met a slave girl, a 16-year-old girl possessed with the spirit of divination. And Paul commanded the spirit out because this lady kept on saying that Paul and Barnabas, they are the men of the most high God that show us the way to salvation. And this, this lady did for many days, but Paul did not realize that the source of the woman's speaking was evil. Paul did not pick that up. Is it not true that they are men from God? Yes. Is it not true that they are telling us the way of salvation. Yes. Is there anything wrong with that? On the surface, there's nothing wrong with that. Not knowing the woman was speaking by a wrong spirit. But the Bible said that after many days, Paul got troubled in his spirit. It's English language to mean that he picked up the signal. And when I said, ah, 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 this girl is not operating quite. She was operating by a spirit of divination, a.k.a. juju occultic power. So Paul commanded the spirit out. Then the Bible says that when the owners of this girl found out that their channel to make money profit has been stopped because she will use the divination to tell people things and they'll give them money. They gathered the entire city against Paul and his, and his companion. And that's what he was talking about. Not only that, so many troubles happened there. So does that mean that because there were troubles, Paul is out of the will of God? No, never. Look at that. For we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about the affliction and oppressing distress which befell us in the province of Asia, how we were 
utterly, we're so utterly and unbearably weighed down and crushed Heba, that we despaired even of life. In fact, in one place, some people bound themselves with an oath that they will not eat until they kill Paul. Why is he an armed robber? He's not stealing anybody. He's bringing light. Men don't like that. He said they were crushed. That means they were stretched. Satan through men. Satan through men who have got religious minds, who were against the order of the life. He ganged them up to attack Paul. And the thing was so bad that Paul spoke about it in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He said, concerning these problems that were going on. So if Paul did not know what he knew, he could have ended up saying that, ah, God, ah, uh ah, -uh, there must be some curse. If I go to Asia, trouble. If I go to Greece, trouble. If I go to Bithynia, trouble. If I go to Cappadocia, trouble. If I go to wherever, trouble. Ah, why, why, why? If it was today, they would end up and say, Paul is under a curse. Hey, the people from your village are looking for you. Your people from your village are looking for you. Paul never said that. Look at what he's saying. He said they were stretched. Huh? That they even despaired of life. That means it got to a point, it looks like, they were going to lose their lives. That's not finished. Indeed, we felt within ourselves uh, that we had received the very sentence of death. Uh, it looks like <laughs> they have condemned us to death. Pass their trouble, pass their trouble. Go to this city riot. In fact, in one of the cities, in one of the Greek cities, the riot was so bad that they, they had to take away, they had to take away one of his companions. And beat him before a Greek ruler called Sosthenes. Beat him. And the whole city were shouting nonstop for two hours. Great is Diana of Artemis. And then the town clerk came and said, you guys quiet. Who in Asia does not know that Diana is the great god that fell from the sky? But if you have got anything, the courts are open and you can prosecute Paul and his gang. What has Paul done? That the whole city will shout for two hours. If it was you and I, we would, <laughs> would run away. Look, an angry mob is not a joke. Look at how they overthrew, through angry mobs, they overthrew some city in Egypt. Angry mob. So that is enough to scare the pants out of you. He said, indeed, we felt within ourselves. So can you compare the problems we are facing to the things Paul are facing, where human beings, want to take your life. Is your life under such a threat? This, and that's why he called them beast of Ephesus. Not animal beasts, but their attitude, their behavior. They were behaving like beasts. But a beast is controlled by a bigger beast. Satan is the beast. Through the mind of men. Kabaya. Their behavior was unbecoming. It's like sometimes you look at some people in your office and the way they are treating you wonder, uh, uh, what is what's going on here? I've not done anything. The person just hates you for nothing. They are looking for your trouble. Satan has entered their mind. But you are the target. But Paul them knew better. Indeed, we felt within ourselves that we had received the very sentence of death. It looked like, oh, we are, we are, we are sentenced to death. But that was to keep us. That was to keep us. Not God bringing it. That was to keep us from trusting what? Look at, look at the principle that we need to learn from Paul. That was happening, right? But to keep us, that don't mean God brought it. What he meant when that kept on happening, rather we trusted not in ourselves. Look at how Paul connected the trust to. Look at where Paul connected them. Always he does that. We didn't trust ourselves. Instead, we trusted in God who raises the dead. So what he's saying is that this cacophony of problem that we are seeing, human beings shouting two hours, great is the diner of our team is. They beat us. 
They put us in jail. Every city we go, they are looking for Paul. They are looking for Paul and his team. Everywhere we go, thinking that Satan is doing something. We trust in God. Why? Because Jesus rising from the dead is far bigger than the noise these people are making. I am depending on the energy, the power within me. They think they are doing something, but I have something more powerful. I don't speak curses back to them. No, never, never, never. Let me show you something that the apostles did rather. Anytime they had problem, they directed their prayer towards God, not against man. That's why Paul would say in, in Romans 12, he said that, that do not repay evil with evil, cursing with reviling. No, 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 no. We don't do that. But look at something. Let's look at something here yeah, that Paul spoke about in terms of the fact that when they did certain things, he stood his ground. He stood in ground. When they reviled, not reviled back. The same to Jesus. Reviled, he did not revile back. He depends. Look at Acts chapter 4. Let's go to Acts chapter 4. Look at their response to trouble. The apostles. Let's go to Acts chapter 4. And let's see what they did there. They rather turn their attention to the power source. To the power source. Let's go to Acts chapter 4. This is when they arrested them. Because in the verse 3, they said, so they laid hands on them, arrested them, and put them in prison until the following day. For it was already evening. So they arrested the apostles. Why? In chapter 3, Peter and John had healed a man and were preaching in the temple area. They found that offensive. Uh -huh. So now, they asked them, verse 7, and they set the men in their midst and repeatedly demanded, by what sort of power? Huh? By what sort of power? By what sort of power or what kind of authority did such people as you, uh, you see the way they are using you, look at you people, huh? Huh? do this healing. Then look at Peter. Huh? Then Peter, because he was, look at it, he was filled and controlled by the Holy Spirit, the source of power. You see that now? Always, always they were filled, ready. Okay, let's go down to what they did. And then look at his answer in verse 10. I want you to see how they, they knew what I am teaching. So when problem comes, they did not complain. They relied on the power inside. They knew that the resurrection of Jesus and the Jesus in them is far superior. So that is where their consciousness goes. Look at the statement. Let it be known. Hey, but the man doesn't care. He's standing before Caiaphas, who Caiaphas, Caiaphas, the high priest, and the and the and the and the and the <laughs> and the jury, which is called Sanhedrin. Let it be known. It's like standing before the military court, which you know that if you don't know and you say one thing wrong, bim. The kind of beating they'll beat you. But these guys were unfettered. They didn't bother. Let it be known and understood by all of you and the whole house of Israel that in the name and in the power. Did you see? The name is the same as the power. The power is the same as the name, which is the authority of Jesus, which is in me, of Nazareth, whom you crucified. Now he's accusing them. But look at the emphasis again. Whom God raised from the dead in him raised from the dead by means of him raised from the dead this man here uh, this man standing here before you well and sound then he quoted this one with the deal like this jesus the stone which was despised and rejected by you the builders but which has become the head of the corner verse 12 and they were bold to say this in front of this court and there is salvation and in and through no one else and there is no other name under heaven giving among men by any which you might be saved. Look at the verse 13. Now, when they saw, watch, watch, Ayabakataya, the boldness and unfettered eloquence of Peter and John, and perceived that they were unlearned and trained in schools, aka they had not gone to school. Huh? Huh? Common men. Huh? with no educational advantages. Did you see that? <laughs> All this thing in Christ is not about uh, education. They marveled and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. 
So which means that the way Jesus would deal with the problem is the same way these guys are dealing with the problem. Then he went on. They ordered them. Look at what they did. Uh huh. So they summoned them, instructed them not to teach in the name of Jesus. What is wrong with about the name of Jesus? What is wrong with that? Huh? But Peter and John replied, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you and obey you rather than God, you must decide. See that now? Uh huh. Look at that. And they permitted them, watch what their response. And they permitted them to go, who? The apostles, Peter, John, the apostles, returned to their own company and told all that the chief priests and elders are settled. Look at the content of their prayer. Look at it. They didn't pray, fall down and die. My enemies, look at the way they treated me. Look at the way my manager is treating me. Look at the way my family members are treating me. I'm going to pray fire and kill them. No, Jesus died for all of them. It is not their fault. Uh, Satan that is influencing their mind. So use your authority, stop the spirit behind the influence, and concentrate on your faith in God and your authority in Christ. Look at what they did, 24. And when they heard it, Kebadiah, they lifted their voices together with one united mind to God and said, oh, sovereign Lord, you are he who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything that is in them, 25. Who by the mouth of our forefather David, your servant and child, said through the Holy Spirit, why did the heathen Gentiles become wanton and insolent and rage and the people imagine and study and plan vain, fruitless things that will not succeed? What is he talking about? When in front of Pontius Pilate, they conspired with Judas to hand Jesus over instead of Barabbas. He said, why have they come together? What is possible? What, what, are they, what is the writer of, of Acts? Luke trying to, he's trying to point the same thing, that no matter the problem, what Jesus did and what he faced is higher and powerful and superior than what we are facing. That if people conspire to kill Jesus, death could not hold him captive, despite their conspiracy. Is your problem bigger than death? Is the situation bigger than dead that man planned? Look at verse 26. The kings, that to the point that, you know, human beings, we are so funny, you know, especially Christians. One small problem, your, your, your very physical life is not being challenged, then we give up. Small pressure, we give up. Small pressure, we throw everything we've learned away. We throw everything away. Then we start to blame God. God, why? But these guys never behave like that. That's why I said that when they saw the boldness, the boldness comes from confidence. Confidence comes from assurance of the promise. The promise is reliable because the evidence is the resurrection. So once I have the evidence, I'm high water. I have something bigger than what you are bringing against me. He said, the kings of the earth took their stand in Ari. Who were the kings of the earth? Pontius Pilate, Caiaphas, and the rest. And the rulers were assembled and combined together against the Lord and against his anointed one, Christ. See that now? For in this city, they actually met and plotted together against your holy child and servant Jesus, whom you consecrated. They plotted. So it's not common. It's not, it's not new to you. By anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and peoples of Israel to carry out all that your hand and your will and purpose had predestined. They were thinking that by allowing Satan, they didn't know that God had already planned something in advance. Kabadiah. Now look at verse 20 and I close with that. And now, Lord, look at that. Observe your threats. Observe and grant your bond servant full freedom to declare your message fearlessly. Look at what they asked, rather. They didn't say, we are praying that this Pontius Pilate and his gang, let them die by fire. No, God will not answer that prayer. He said, no, 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 no. no. We are seeing that the message is having impact. <laughs> so give us rather more boldness to declare the message, which is the power of God. Then look at that. While you stretch out your hand to cure, and perform signs and wonders 
through the authority, by the power, same power of the name of the holy child, servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were assembled was shaken, Kabadaya. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they continued to speak the word of God. How? With freedom and boldness and courage. See that now? It didn't mean they were out of the will of God. They were in the will of God. They knew where they stood. That is what he meant by, we felt the sentence of death, but we stood our ground. So the fact that problems are happening in a prolonged trajectory does not mean that there's anything wrong with you. Does not mean that there's a curse upon you. Does not mean that you are out of the will of God. It is common to man because you carry the light, you carry the revelation, you carry the power, you have this treasure in earthen vessels. So take your authority and stand your ground. We shall continue tomorrow in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.